It's the night of April 13th and Iran is just about to launch a massive attack on Israel. The attack is a response to what it perceives as Israeli violence. Just 13 days earlier, a strike on Iran's consulate in Damascus left 13 people dead, with Iran believing Israel to be the guilty party. It will have its revenge. At 8 p.m., Iran launches a barrage of around 300 missiles, cruise missiles, and explosive drones toward Israel. That barrage included 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, and around 170 drones in what represents one of the few times that Iran has directly attacked a country in over two decades. It's not using proxies anymore. The majority of the missiles and the drones were shot down, being intercepted outside of Israel's borders thanks to a concerted effort by US, French, and UK forces. Even Jordan got in on the action. It shot down several missiles as they flew through Jordanian airspace, but not every missile met the same fate. Some broke through these combined anti-air defenses, with reports from Al Jazeera claiming that explosions were heard in several Israeli cities, including the capital Tel Aviv. The attack was not the most effective in the world. Israel reports that a small number of missile hits caused minor infrastructural damage to one of its bases in the south of the country. Missile fragments inflicted minor injuries to several people, with more receiving treatment for the anxiety the strike caused. The main victim was a seven-year-old girl who received severe injuries due to being struck by fragments. Whether you consider the attack a success or not, and whether it's simply a warning from Iran to Israel or a full-blown declaration of war, there is one thing that is certain. Iran has announced itself as a major player in the Middle East crisis. The question now is simple. How might Iran plan to attack Israel if a full-blown war starts? The answer? It plans to take a leaf out of Russia's playbook by using the very same strategies that Moscow's used to slowly whittle away at Ukraine. At least that's the opinion of a US think tank, named the Institute for the Study of War, or ISW, responding to requests for comments on the evening of Iran's missile attack. It said that Iran's use of drones and missiles shows how Iran is learning from the Russians to develop increasingly dangerous and effective strike packages against Israel. That certainly seems to be the case. Over the two-plus years of the war between Russia and Ukraine, Moscow has launched literally thousands of missiles and drones into the country. Reuters highlights the scale of the assault. It claims that the first four months of 2024 alone have seen Ukraine fend off around 1,200 missiles along with 1,500 drones and 8,500 guided bombs, all aimed at key targets in Ukraine's territory. Those numbers come from the country's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, who says that Kyiv simply isn't capable of keeping pace with Russia in terms of long-range missile production. Instead, it's having to focus on building and developing long-range attack drones in an effort to hit back. Through this, we see that at least one aspect of Russia's tactics is clear constantly bombard Ukraine with missiles and drones, both to force it to stay in an ever-vigilant state of defense against aerial attacks and, when those missile volleys penetrate, to take out key targets in the country. However, the ISW says that Russia's missile strikes serve another purpose, helping Vladimir Putin determine how to create an optimal strike package for penetrating the western air and missile defenses that Ukraine relies upon to defend itself against aerial attacks. It's through this purpose that we can see Iran copying Russia's tactics, according to the ISW. Although Iran has publicly claimed that its missile and drone strike on Israel was a direct response to the previously mentioned assault on its Damascus consulate, the ISW believes the strike was more of a test than a concerted effort to cause damage to Israeli bases. Iran wanted to cause as much damage as it could, though it only succeeded in a minor way, if Israel is to be believed. But its other goal was to determine just how powerful the defenses its missiles would meet would be. It got its answers. Iran learned, as confirmed by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, that the U.S. had moved both ballistic missile and aircraft defense systems into the region surrounding Israel prior to its attack. It also saw the U.S. shoot down dozens of its drones and missiles, according to Austin, with those interceptions occurring on missiles fired not only from Iran but also from Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Those interceptions provided Iran with valuable information. It now knows that a volley of 300 missiles and drones likely isn't going to be enough for it to cause major damage to Israel. It'll need to fire more if it hopes to overwhelm the defenses that Israel has in place. Iran now also knows more about what those defenses are and what they're capable of, allowing it to go back to the drawing board to plan new attacks that could help it overwhelm or even circumvent those defenses. That's according to the ISW, which says that Iran is now working at how they can evade and overwhelm US air and maritime defenses more effectively. It's clear at this point that Iran is playing a clever game. Its first missile and drone volley may not have been designed to cause major damage to Israel, despite the proclamations that it was a retaliation for the Damascus attack. 
Rather, as so often is the case with Iran, that attack was used as an excuse for Tehran to test out a tactic that it has seen Russia use to great success in Ukraine. It figured out that a volley of 300 is not enough. It'll need to fire more or attack from different directions in the future if it hopes to copy Russia's tactics in Ukraine. But all of that brings us to an important question. If it's clear that Iran is learning from Russia's missile offensive in Ukraine, according to the ISW, would it even be capable of following its lead to launch a similar offensive against Israel? To answer that question, we need to start digging into some numbers. We'll start with Russia and its missile and drone stockpiles. As you would imagine, those stockpiles have been massively depleted since the beginning of the Ukraine conflict, especially given that Russia has so consistently used both weapons to attack Ukraine. So the numbers are difficult to come by. One report published by Yahoo News in November 2023 quoted Andriy Yusov of Ukraine's main intelligence directorate as claiming that Russia was down to 870 strategic-level missiles in its stockpile. Those included 40 KH-101 cruise missiles, 20 caliber missiles, and 30 Iskander-M ballistic missiles. Yusuf went on to say that Russia was burning through missiles at a faster rate than it was producing them, with his belief being that they only manufactured 115 high-precision missiles in October 2023. But something doesn't add up here. Earlier, we told you that Russia fired 1,200 missiles into Ukraine in 2024 alone. How could it do that if it only had a stockpile of 870 leading into the winter of 2023? Part of the reason it's been able to sustain its attacks is that it produces missiles at a fairly high rate. Back in May 2023, Ukraine's main directorate of intelligence stated that Russia was producing 25 caliber missiles monthly, along with 35 X-101 missiles, 5 9M723 ballistic missiles, and 2 Kinzals. And as we learned from Yahoo News, the country has increased its missile production capabilities since then to the point where it's building at least 115 missiles per month. Even if it's unable to sustain the sheer levels of missile attacks we've seen in the war up to this point, Russia's high production levels will at least give it enough missiles to continue attacking. Then there's the ineffectiveness of the sanctions, designed to prevent Russia from acquiring materials and missiles that come into play. And that's according to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, which published a piece in June 2023 with a stark warning that Russia isn't going to run out of missiles, though it highlighted that Russia spent much of 2022 expending long-range missiles in its assault on Ukraine. It also pointed out that 2023 saw no slowdown in these strikes. According to CSIS, it appears likely that Russia will be able to produce or otherwise acquire the long-range strike capacity necessary to inflict significant damage upon Ukraine's people, economy, and military. It's the otherwise acquire part of that quote that deserves the extra attention. In addition to producing its own missiles, Russia is believed to be buying missiles from other countries that it's then using to strike Ukraine. That's according to Washington, which claimed in January 2024 that Russia has started using missiles purchased from North Korea in Ukraine. The White House didn't state precisely which missiles Russia is buying from Pyongyang. Instead, it released a graphic that appears to show North Korean-made KN-23 and KN-25 short-range ballistic missiles, or SRBMs, capable of traveling about 500 miles to support its claims. For what it's worth, Russia and North Korea have repeatedly denied conducting any arms deals. However, South Korea claimed in November 2023 that North Korea had sent at least 2,000 shipping containers to Russia via Rasong a North Korean special economic zone. They're suspected to have contained missiles along with rifles, artillery shells, and other military equipment. A month later, Reuters also reported that Russia had been sourcing missiles from another country, Iran. In a February 2024 report, the news outlet claimed that Russia purchased 400 missiles from Iran, mostly from Iran's Fateh-110 family of SRBMs, with most being capable of striking targets between 186 and 435 miles away. Those shipments began in January, though Tehran and Moscow refused to comment on them. Why is all of this information important? In the context of Russia's continued missile strikes, having a continued supply of missiles to replenish its depleting stocks is critical. We now know that Russia is producing at least 115 new missiles per month, maybe building more as it keeps ramping its production up, and it's likely importing missiles from North Korea and Iran at the very least. In other words, Russia can only use the missile and drone tactics it's been using because it has a steady supply of both pieces of equipment. To emulate Russia's approach in Ukraine against Israel, Iran would similarly need to start with a large stockpile of missiles and crucially have the ability to produce and purchase more missiles to keep its barrage going. A stockpile is certainly what it has. According to US Central Command, 
Iran is believed to have around 3,000 missiles ready to launch if it ever goes to war. In fact, that estimate may be even on the low end, with the Washington Post suggesting that it may have more based on the evidence that it was willing to deploy over 100 ballistic missiles in a retaliatory strike against Israel. That level of deployment doesn't come without confidence, especially when Iran knew it was likely many of the missiles would be shot down, suggesting that its stockpiles may be higher than anticipated. We also know a little more about the types of missiles that Iran might use if it started launching continuous missile strikes against Israel. The Washington Post says that the three ballistic missiles used in the April 13th attack were the Kaybar Khan, the Imad, and the Gedar. All three are medium-range ballistic missiles, or MRBMs, capable of traveling at least 900 miles. Specifically, the Kaybar Khan can travel up to 900 miles while carrying an 1,100-pound warhead. The Imad can go further and carry heavier loads, being capable of reaching targets up to 1,056 miles away with a 1,650-pound warhead. And the Gedar can travel even further than that, 1,211 miles with a 1,760-pound warhead. The Washington Post also points out that Iran fired Paveh cruise missiles in the attacks, which can also travel about 1,000 miles. Add to all of this the missiles that Iran didn't use. These include the Shahab-3 and the Sejil-1, which are both MRBMs capable of reaching Israel. Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi was also quick to point out that the initial volley of 300 missiles and drones was never meant to be a large-scale action. Hailing the strike as a success, he was quick to say, if it was supposed to be a large-scale action, nothing would have been left of the Zionist regime. Still, digging into the numbers may reveal that Iran wouldn't be capable of emulating Russia's missile-based approach in Ukraine over a long period. If we take the estimates that Iran has 3,000 missiles as given, and even assume that all those missiles are capable of reaching Israel, we can stack that number up against Russia's output. Earlier, we learned that Russia has fired about 1,200 missiles at Ukraine during the first four months of 2024. If Iran hit the same volume, its missile stockpile would be completely depleted in about a year. There may be other problems for Iran to confront, too. For instance, John Krizhanyak, who is a researcher at the Wisconsin Project on Nuclear Arms Control, disputes Ricey's claims that the April 13th attack on Israel was a limited display of Iran's missile and drone capabilities. He believes it was the opposite, claiming that Iran basically threw everything it had that could reach Israel's territory. His conclusion after studying the strike was that Iran had used a little bit of everything it had, barring the previously mentioned Shahab-3 and Sejil-1 systems. Furthermore, those missiles may have been excluded as a show of power by Iran or an attempt to prove that it didn't need to use every type of missile in its arsenal to conduct a strike, or they may not have been used because they're not reliable enough. That's according to Fabian Hertz, an analyst at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Based in Berlin, he claims that the Shahab-3 wasn't used simply because it's too old, meaning it wouldn't stand a chance of penetrating American or Israeli missile defense systems. As for Sejil-1, he says the missile's still very much a mystery, with the little information available on it coming from its extremely occasional use in training maneuvers. An age problem could still be at play, only this time Sejil-1 may be too new to be ready for deployment. So we end up with a mixed picture here. In terms of pure numbers, Iran appears to have enough missiles to launch a sustained attack against Israel in the same vein as the one Russia launched against Ukraine. At least it could do so for about a year. After that point, its stockpiles would be completely depleted. Worse yet, if the analysts at the Washington Post quoted are correct, Iran's strike proved that Israel, with help from its allies, can defend itself against the best Iran has to offer, and that Iran might not even use some of its stockpiles because its missiles are too old or too new. But there's still an aspect of Iran's attack and Russia's strategy that we haven't even covered yet – drones. It's possible that Iran might look to shore up its flagging missile numbers with drones as a fight with Israel dragged on. According to Defense Express, Iran is capable of producing around 150 drones per month. It's not exactly clear what types of drones those are, with the news outlet suggesting that that number likely covers production of Iran's Shahed drones. Those drones are made using fairly cheap civilian products sourced from Syria, Tajikistan, and Iran itself, meaning it may not be too much of an effort for Iran to ramp up production if it did enter a war with Israel. It's also worth pointing out that Iran has played a role in helping Russia build its own drone stockpiles. That's according to CNN, which reported in July 2023 that Iran was helping Russia to build a drone stockpile that was orders of magnitude larger 
than what the intelligence community believed Russia to have at the point. The Defense Intelligence Agency which provided that comment also suggested that most of the drones Iran was sending were from its Sahed range, and that it had delivered more than 400 of them up to the middle of 2023. Moscow has used those drones to attack Ukrainian infrastructure and put the pressure on the country's air defenses, often opening up the way for missiles to land on their targets. Perhaps that's an indicator of the tactics Iran might use in a war against Israel. Given its high drone production rates, Iran might use the Sahed drones to confuse or deplete anti-missile defenses with follow-up volleys of missiles then making their way through to Israel after Iran has sacrificed its cheaply made drones. But that's speculation. Still, it may indicate the route Iran would take in a war against Israel, especially if that war was as protracted as the one we've seen between Russia and Ukraine. Add to all of this the likelihood that Israel has already used many of the missiles it has stockpiled in its fights against Hamas and Hezbollah, and there's a chance that Iran could overwhelm Israel with a little in the way of reply. That's if it can keep its numbers up long enough to launch continuous attacks against Israel. Iran now knows that sending 100 or so missiles along with a similar number of drones won't get the job done. Israel's defenses are too strong. It'll need to send more with each attack, meaning we might see it whittle away at its stockpile faster than Russia has in Ukraine, making a protracted war one that Iran likely isn't going to win using missiles alone. And it's here that we might start to see Iran emulate other Russian tactics. Chief among them would be attempting to win the war through sheer numbers. Beyond its missile strikes, Russia has attempted to overwhelm Ukraine both in terms of manpower and the amount of equipment it's able to transport into the country. How many Russian soldiers have been lost to the meat grinder is up in the air. In April 2024, the BBC reported that Moscow had confirmed losses of 50,000, though Ukraine claims the losses are actually much higher. The country's official website puts the number at 442,880 troops. That's a huge disparity. But regardless of which number you believe, it's clear that Russia has been able to throw a lot of people at Ukraine and has many more waiting in the wings. Iran may emulate that approach. According to Global Firepower, Iran has 610,000 active military personnel compared to Israel's 170,000, though Israel has 465,000 reservists compared to Iran's 350,000. That gives us a total number of 960,000 for Iran compared to 635,000 for Israel, a difference of more than 300,000 soldiers that Iran might bring to bear if it launched an invasion against Israel. Add to that, Iran is a much larger country than Israel. If the war were to drag on, Iran would have 41.1 million people who are fit for military service to call upon compared to 3.1 million in Israel. However, sheer numbers of people alone may not win a war for Iran. These people need equipment, and it's here where a ground-based invasion strategy might fall down. Iran and Israel are closely matched in terms of the equipment they can provide to their ground troops. For instance, Iran has 1,996 tanks compared to Israel's 1,370, and it has around 22,000 more armored vehicles. That bodes well for Iran. It also has far more towed artillery, 2,050, compared to Israel's 300 units, though that artillery is vulnerable when used in territory that a country doesn't already own. However, Israel has a little more self-propelled artillery, and you can't discount the fact that it would fortify it in the event of an Iranian invasion, much as Ukraine has against Russia, which would make it difficult for Iran to bring its higher numbers to bear. Iran would also face the problem of getting into Israel. The countries are separated by Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. The latter has a peace treaty with Israel, meaning Iran couldn't use it as a point of ingress. Syria and Lebanon would be more likely options, especially Lebanon considering Israel is already targeting Hezbollah, an Iranian proxy in the country, but Iran would also have to secure passage through Iraq to get there. Whether that would happen, especially given that it would draw Iraq into the war, is uncertain. And even if Iran was able to get into Lebanon, the border through the country shares with Israel is fairly small, giving Israel a chance to create a bottleneck through which it could gain a tactical advantage over Iran on the ground. That's very different than Russia's situation with Ukraine, for which Putin has been able to use his nation's own border along with Belarus to insert troops into the country. All of this means that though Iran has the numbers to emulate Russia's strategy of throwing manpower at its opponent, it may not have the means to do so, and it would be much harder for Iranian troops to get into Israel than it was for Russian troops to enter Ukraine. Of course, the manpower issue is speculative, especially given that Iran hasn't launched an invasion. What's less speculative, though, 
is that both Russia and Iran have made use of proxies in their respective conflicts, though they've done so in very different ways. For Russia, the use of proxies has not been an attempt to distract away from its intentions. Instead, it's used mercenary forces such as the infamous Wagner Group to attack directly in Ukraine while supplementing its own forces. Russia isn't hiding behind those proxies by funding them to do its dirty work while keeping its own hands clean, at least in Ukraine. It's working alongside them to put even more pressure on Kyiv. Iran has used proxies too, though in different ways. For instance, the October 2023 attack on Israel by Hamas that launched the entire conflict in the Middle East could be considered an attack by Iran by proxy. The Washington Institute argues that Iran has funded, armed, and trained Hamas for decades, with the implicit agreement likely being that this backing comes in return for Hamas conducting operations that are favorable to Iran in the Middle East, operations like Hamas's attack on Israel. The Council on Foreign Relations points out that Iran has had a similar relationship with Hezbollah, which Israel has confronted in Lebanon, plus it has a relationship with the Houthis in Yemen and it's likely supplying them as they launch attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. It's not outside the realms of possibility that Iran would use all of these proxy insurgent groups in its war against Israel, similar to how Russia uses its paramilitary proxies in Ukraine. You could even argue it's already happening. Israel's already fighting against Hamas and Hezbollah, and via the Houthis in Yemen, Iran might even see a way to launch a naval invasion into Israel via the Red Sea, though it would need to go through Egypt to do so. Bringing things back to missiles, Iran's relationship with Hezbollah in Lebanon comes with another advantage. Lebanon is much closer to Israel than Iran. Iran might use Lebanon as the launching point for its missile volleys in the war, meaning its missiles would have to travel far shorter distances to reach Israel. That in turn would give Israel's anti-missile defenses far less time to shoot Iran's missiles and drones down, potentially opening the door for emulating the missile strike tactic as Iran funnels troops into Israel via Lebanon. Of course, all of this is conditional on Iran being able to transport its troops, missiles, and drones through Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. So we start to see the similarities in Iran's potential strategy against Israel and what Russia has done in Ukraine. Though the use of proxies differs, the fact remains that both countries have them and leverage them to achieve their own ends. And thanks to Iran's strike on April 13th, we've also seen that Tehran is willing to launch large numbers of missiles at Israel, suggesting it has a significant enough stockpile to engage in more concentrated attacks. Then there's the nuclear option. Putin's made numerous statements suggesting he'd be willing to use tactical nukes against Ukraine, even warning that Russia is ready for nuclear war as recently as March 2024. Iran would find it more difficult to copy that threat. It's claimed for years that it doesn't have a nuclear weapons program, an assertion that many, including the United States, dispute. And it certainly doesn't have anywhere near the number of nukes that Russia possesses, but that doesn't mean it has no nuclear threat. Reuters reports that Iran is enriching uranium up to 60% purity as of April 2024, with the International Atomic Energy Agency suggesting it has enough uranium to produce at least two nuclear weapons. It also could make those nukes quickly. Its breakout time, how long it needs to make weapons-grade uranium, is close to zero, meaning it may be able to create nukes in a matter of weeks. Of course, there would be a wrinkle in that plan. Israel has nukes too, more than Iran's theoretical arsenal and certainly enough to respond to any nuclear threat from Tehran with one of its own. Still, it is clear that Russia may have created the blueprint that Iran could roughly follow if it went to war with Israel. Iran certainly has enough missiles to launch repeated strikes, though the effectiveness of those strikes is up in the air. It's also producing and using drones at a high rate, and through its proxies could find an inroad into Israel to launch a full-scale invasion. The nuclear option may not be practically open to Iran, though it could produce nukes in theory, which would allow it to emulate another aspect of Russia's strategy. Do you believe that Iran would even consider invading Israel? And if it did, would it follow a strategy similar to that used by Russia in Ukraine? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Then check out why Iron Beam can't replace Israel's Iron Dome. Or watch this video instead.